Aloha. Welcome to the Mr. G podcast. Today is episode number 42. We're going to be talking about George Orwell's five rules of writing. If you ever want to write a book, if you ever want to write an essay, if you ever want to write anything, that's where you need to go. Today is Wednesday, June 28th, 2023. It's just before 10 a.m. here on the outskirts of Chinatown in Honolulu, Hawaii, the largest city in the Pacific, my city. And like I said, today we're going to do George Orwell's Five Rules of Writing. If you were not aware, your host, your podcast host, me, Mr. G, I like whipped cream on my coffee, and I'm also a writer. Full Through and, and through. Through and through, I'm a fucking writer. I, I, I try not to say the F word. I am a writer. Okay, I've known that I was a writer since I was born. I've spent years, decades perfecting my craft as a writer. Oh, yeah. What have you written? Well, my first book is one of the most highly reviewed books on Amazon, Gonzo Education. It's the first book of a three book series, the Gonzo series. And I only write nonfiction. I received my degree in print journalism from the University of Texas School of Journalism. That's what my first book is about, Gonzo Education. It starts when I drop out of high school and it ends when I graduate from this prestigious journalism school. The second book, which is almost finished, takes place immediately when the first book ends. And it's also a really great book. Now, the thing is about being a writer, um, you do get asked occasionally, oh, you wrote a book? I want to write a book. And it's extremely insulting when a, a, a tip, a layman, normal person that didn't go to school for writing, that didn't spend years writing, that wasn't born like a talented writer like myself, because writing, you know, it's something that comes naturally to you, to, to an individual. Of course, you have to perfect your craft. You have to practice your craft. But really, some people can do it and some can't. And it's the most insulting thing. And they don't know they're being insulting when somebody hears I write a book. And the first thing they say is, oh, I want to write a book. How do I do it? Huh? You, you, if you can do it, I can do it. Huh? Look at you. Look at your shoes. Huh? I have better shoes. I should be able to write a better book. Right? No, not the case at all. Like I said, spent years in school, spent years perfecting my craft. And also, I was born a very talented writer, a very talented storyteller. So it's not something that everybody can do. Writing the, my first book, Gonzo Education, by myself, without an editor, without a uh, publicist, without any help at all, was a very hard thing to do. And the only reason I was able to accomplish it and write such a good book is because I spent so many years in school studying my craft and perfecting my craft. But if I do want to give somebody words of advice on how they could write a book, I would point them to George Orwell's rules of writing. And what Ernest Hemingway says, good writing is actually good editing. Uh, tomorrow's podcast, we'll go over um, Hemingway's iceberg theory, which I also used in writing my first book. So like I said, if you ever see me on the street, if you ever talk to me, don't tell me, don't ask me how to write a book, okay? Go to fucking school, write your own goddamn book, because I would never in a million years go to a writer and ask them how to write a book. If I had never spent years in journalism school, spent years writing short stories, spent years writing poetry, spent years reading. And it's the, the most uh, harebrained thing when somebody comes up to you, somebody that has never read a book and they say, oh, I want to write a book. If he can write a book, I could write a book. No, you can't. But maybe you can, maybe you have a little writing talent. Maybe, maybe you have something going for you. And if that, that's the case, it's all about editing. Okay. If you're really serious and you really think that you can write a book, well, it's all about editing. You got to have a, something to work with. You have to have a working copy is what it's called. That's your first draft, right? Now my working copy for Gonzo Education, this book right here, it's 240 pages. Originally this book, 750 pages almost three times as long and most of it got left on the cutting room full floor and even if it's a very good story even if it's a very personal story even if it's a a little antidote that i really enjoyed that i really wanted to share with people if it doesn't fit the mold of the book if it doesn't fit the flow of the book if it doesn't fit certain topics spoken about certain themes of the book then you can't have it in there. Then it's pointless to have it in there. But if you really wanted to write a book and you want to do it yourself, 
first off, you got to be a badass like me. All right. It's going to be hard. It's going to take years. You're going to have to rewrite, rewrite over and over. And then, then you'll finally get to the editing part. And the editing part, you're just taking out everything. Like I said, my book was originally 750 pages long. I had to take the majority of it out of it. And I spent years working on it across the United States in public libraries across the United States while I was homeless. And I put my blood, sweat, and tears into this book. And and, and in the end, I created something that's going to outlive me and outlive you who's ever listening to this podcast. This book, Gonzo Education, people will be reading it hundreds of years from now, but it wasn't easy. It was extremely hard to write. It took me years to write. And that's after acquiring a degree in journalism and a, a degree in nonfiction writing. So if you want to go ahead and go and try this endeavor, you think you're going to write a book? Okay, but I'm telling you, it's not easy. And then when somebody does come to me and wants advice on how to write a book because it seems so easy if i can do it anybody can do it right look at my teeth look at my shoes right Nah, not the case but where i point them is george orwell's rules five rules of writing and if they still want more information i'll tell them about hemingberg's iceberg hemingway's iceberg theory and that's even too far so uh, we'll go over george orwell's five rules for writing which are is helpful even if you're writing an email so george orwell Best known for his novel, novels Animal Farm, The Road to Wigan Pier in 1984. Eric Arthur Blair, a.k.a. George Orwell, was also a key essayist, journalist, and critic. As such, Orwell created rules for writing, six of them to be precise. As a copywriter of all of Orwell's work, it's his 1945 essay, Politics in the English Language, that stands out. Pretty dry and uninteresting, that's for sure. But on learning that it was only 32 pages long, I thought I ought to get grips with it. Um, this is written by Drop Cap Copy. Okay, uh, What it's about, it's basically an essay on the importance of clear and precise language in any kind of writing. Orwell spells out that people in power, politicians and the like, usually are confusing and unclear language to baffle the general public. While this is true and definitely remains so today, to overcome this, Orwell created his list of six writing rules that he believed all writers should stick to. All right, so we're going to go over six rules. Now, I know the, most of them off the top of my head. The one that I see so often, and I'll give you an example. Um, I was uh, doing a live stream maybe like a year ago, and it, this is just an example. But like I said, it comes up really often. I could give you dozens of examples. But I think about this one precisely. Uh when I was doing a live stream, I was like smoking pot, right? And then like a hater, a troll came in there and he's like, oh, you're such a loser, Mr. G, smoking a copious amount of marijuana. And then I'm like, a copious amount? Guys, normally if somebody throws in flowery language or tries to use like five syllable words and just trying to sound impressive, eh, that's a wrong thing to do in writing. A trained eye, an actual writer, can point that out in a second. That's so amateur. If you're thinking, oh, I'll use this big word and they'll think I'm smart. Also, other people uh, that have never read and don't know how to write, if they want to insult a writer and they don't even know how to fucking read, for God's sake, they'll say something like, oh, his book's no good. The commas are in the wrong place. Because in their mind, good writing is putting the commas in the right place. And bad writing, you put the commas in the wrong place, so it's bad. That's the difference between good and bad, the commas. And literally, I had these fucking troll incel live streamers. For some god reason, I, I sent them the, my book, and they're like, Oh, that book is trash. Oh, the commas in the wrong place. And it's just like, what the fuck? But the rule you see uh, broken so much is when somebody tries to use a big word to try to sound smart or to try to sound educated. And when there's a simpler word, just like the live stream troll that was like, he's smoking a copious amount of pot. A copious? Do you mean a lot? Do you mean uh, an excessive would be an okay word? A copious? One of George Orwell's rules for writing is if it's not a common word and you can exchange it for a common word, always exchange it for the common word. Don't try to sell, sound like you're smart by using a, a big word. Don't try to sound like you're special. And and, and and God, 
you're not, you know, if you're if you're using that. And you can point that out in a second. So and 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 lawyers and politicians and doctors, they're guilty of breaking these six simple rules. There's really five rules, okay? But George Orwell's rules for writing, we'll go over all five right here. Number one, never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech which you are used to seeing in print. You want your metaphors and your similes to be original. You want to think of them yourself. You know, don't use something that people have used a million times. I had to go through my book and every metaphor that you hear see in here, except for maybe one, is an original metaphor. It's something that you created in your own mind. And, and using just a, a cliche metaphor, people don't like. It's just so boring. Like people have heard it before. You don't need to use a metaphor or a simile to explain something unless you invented the metaphor or simile. Number two, never use a long word where a short one will do. I think we went over this one. You know, the the uneducated, the people that can barely read and, and if they want to sound smart or anybody. So maybe somebody is educated, but usually it's when they want to sound smart and they'll use a, a, a long word or a flowery word when a simple word will be would be suffice. Always go with the simpler word. You want your reader, your, your reading, your writing to reach as many people as possible. In journalism school, they teach you that your writing should be at about an eighth or ninth grade level. Why? Because the majority of people read much lower than that. Okay? Like I've told people that. I'm like, yeah, I've wrote my book, Gonzo Education. It's really easy to read. Um, you know, even people that never read could read it all the way through in a, in a few days. I wrote it at an eighth or ninth grade level. And the same, you know, haters are, oh, the commas are in the wrong place. They're like, you wrote it on eighth grade level. I got through ninth grade, but I'm better. That, that's literally how they are. Speaking of retards, I watched the Theo Vaughn podcast yesterday I, I, for the first time. I have nothing against Theo Vaughn. He seems like a nice guy. Uh, but I watched his podcast and it was so uh, it was funny how like at one point he was trying to read something serious and it was just like comical how he was reading it like a little kid. It's just like whatever school and whatever teachers he <laughs> was in, it's just like I have nothing against them. All right. But, you know, mainly you just see people's clips of podcasts. So I've only seen clips of Theo Vaughn's podcast and sometimes it's funny. But if you watch the whole three or four hour podcast, I wrote an essay about this today. That's what today's essay is about. If you watch his whole podcast, it's just like there's so much dead air and they're just trying to th talk out their ass, just anything. Like yesterday, they made he had another comedian on and he always has to have somebody else. They can't do it solo like I'm doing. And there's not like continuous flow like this. There's dead air. That there's him just trying to pull shit out of his ass just to say something. But like I said, I got nothing against Theo Vaughn. Theo Vaughn is a testament towards you know, white trash people that people sometimes assume I am, which I'm not. Everybody in my family have, has masters and PhDs and far from white trash. My father's a multimillionaire. He's a total scumbag. I haven't seen him since my mom's funeral 20 years ago. He's a horrible person. He's going to rot in hell. But give him credit. He is a millionaire. He can't take that money with him. Theo Vaughn, uh, he really is like kind of white trash and, you know, from a poor uh, place. But like I said, he seems like a good guy. Theo's Vaughn is a testament that you can, you know, still make it even if you're an inbred. Your mama could also be your sister and you're still good. You're still a good dude. That doesn't that doesn't mean that you can't make it in stand up comedy or podcasts. I, I see you, Theo. I see you. You know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Your mom is also your sister. That's OK. It happens. All right. Maybe not in most uh, parts of the country, but where you're from, Appalachia, it's OK. It's OK, Theo. So uh, back to George Orwell's rules for writing. <sighs> Number three, it is possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. So like I said, uh, George Orwell is um, a, a great writer, wrote 1984. But like I said, my book was originally uh, 750 pages long. I had to cut it down to 240 pages. Uh, if you can take it out, take it out. And like I said, it might be personal to you. Uh, it, it might be a, a, a certain uh, antidote that you really like. It might be funny. But if you can take it out, take it out. And if it doesn't go with the flow, 
then you got to take it out. And that's hard to do because writers, you know, they treat their writing, a real writer, a true writer loves what he writes and it's hard for them to just keep it. But you can save it to yourself. Maybe you can publish a, a different version later. But when you're just getting off and you're just doing your first book, you want to take out as much as possible. If you can take it out, take it out. So that's rule number three. Number four, never use the passive when you can use the active. All right, college students grading their papers. That's the number one problem they have. And that's the number one problem I've had as well with writing is passive voice. You always want the active voice and you don't want the passive voice. And this kind of goes with rule number three is if, if it's possible to take a word out, then take it out. And that's what passive voice is. You're adding too many words when, when you can say something uh, a lot easier and less words. I'll try to think of an example here. So if I say, um, uh, if I want to explain how uh, my neighbors are rude and uh, dirty, I would say, I uh, I would if I wanted to, to explain how my neighbors are rude, um, I would instead of just saying my neighbors are rude, passive voice. Well, maybe that's not a good example. Uh, passive voice would be. Um, I, I guess it's it's more common when you're telling a story. So let's say I, I want to say I I went down and fed the street cats today. So I'm writing. I I I walked down the stairs and fed the street cats. Okay, so instead of uh, that's active voice, I walked down the stairs and fed the street cats. There's no uh, added words in there. So uh, I'll, I'll bring an example for active and passive voice tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to do Hemingway's iceberg theory, and I'll show you some examples of active voice and passive voice. And I'll even take the examples from my book. I'll say I'll take the passive voice, which was the original and uh, on, on some original edits, and I'll show you how you change that to active. But I can tell you right now, if you the, the thing to do that, if you want to change a passive sentence to an active sentence, you're taking out as many words as possible. And Ernest Hemingway is great at that. Uh, his sentences do not have any passive voice. They're strong, solid sentences. The man went to the boat. The man caught the fish. And, and you're just saying what needs to be said. You're not adding any extra words. Rule number five, never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word or jargon word if you can think of an everyday e English equivalent. Once again, rule number five is similar uh, to rule number one and similar to rule number two. Rule number one, never use a metaphor or simile or other figure of, of speech, which you're used to seeing in print. That's like don't be in cliche. It's more similar to rule number two. Never use a long word when a short one would do. So rule number five, never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. Don't use flowery language. Don't think you're a hot shot by using a big word. It's going to make you look bad. If there's a common English word, use that. However, you don't want to use common expressions, metaphors, or similes. You don't want to do that. But common words on their own, that's something that you use. And the last rule, number six, break any of these rules sooner than saying anything outright barbarous. Okay, rule number six, I, I don't really agree with, to be honest. Rule number six, again, break any of these rules sooner than saying anything outright barbarous. All right, um, that's subjective. Whether something is barbarous or not is subjective. And people can write whatever they want to write just because you don't like the topic. So I really consider George Orwell's five rules of writing. And the most important rule is number three. If it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. But in general, when you're editing a book, this is what you want to look at. George Orwell's five rules of writing. So the people that come up to me, Mr. G, Gregory Brandt, and they say, whoa, wow, you wrote a book? How'd you do it? What website you use? I want to do it. If you can do it, I can do it. And I try to show them to five rules of writing. They're never going to get to this point. All right, George Orwell's five rules for writing, that's for the people that actually know what they're doing, the actual writers. And it's going to take you years to get to the editing point where you actually use these five rules if you want to write a book. However, George Orwell's five rules of writings, they, uh, they are useful with everyday emails. They're useful with writing letters, with writing essays. Uh, if you're taking online classes, any kind of writing, you want to follow George Orwell's rules for writing. Even if you're typing comments on a uh, live stream, 
use George Orwell's five rules of writing. All right. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to go over Ernest Hemingway's iceberg theory. And uh, also show you some examples of passive voice and active voice. Um, I actually have never read George Orwell. I uh, read 1984 briefly. I dated a woman that uh, liked him a lot, uh, but I've never been into fiction. I don't read fiction and I don't write fiction. Uh, I do plan on writing possibly one novel in my life, uh, but the majority of my books are nonfiction, including Gonzo Education. Uh, it's one of the highest rated books on Amazon. Uh, this is the first of a three part series. The second book is uh, almost completed. But I could finish it in about six months. I've been holding off because uh, I'm waiting for my first book to become more popular before publishing the second book. Uh, and then there's a third book. Uh, the second book, the sequel to Gonzo Education, starts immediately when Gonzo Education ends, when I receive my college degree. And it's all about traveling west across the United States. I started working on organic farms. Uh, so the first chapter takes place in Austin. Uh, this entire book, my first book, Gonzo Education, takes place majority in Texas, with the exception of one chapter in Berkeley, California. But my second book, only the first chapter is in Texas. The second chapter is at a farm about a farm in New Mexico. The third chapter is about the Occupy movement uh, that I joined in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I didn't get along with the Occupy kids at all. Uh, they were generally, it was a mix between homeless people and stuck up rich kids. And I didn't like either side. So I was basically kicked out of the Occupy camp, to be honest. I talk about it more in my second book. Uh, but <laughs> those guys, they were breaking up. They were uh, vandalizing the Bank of America building. They thought they were hot shits. I'm like, do your dad, do your, don't your parents work there? You know, like they bought you all your clothes and give you thousands of dollars and put you through college, but you're attacking a Bank of America. So that's uh, uh, in my second book. Um, after I left the Occupy movement, I went to Las Vegas, Nevada and attempted to become a professional sports gambler. That didn't work out. And I didn't like Las Vegas, hardcore ghetto city, full of crime, full of sin. Uh, so I went up north to Reno, Nevada. I like Reno. Um, it's so close to hell. You can see sparks. Only people from Reno get that joke. If I ever, If you ever meet somebody from Reno, tell them that joke. Say, Oh, Reno, I hear it's so close to hell, you can see sparks. And the reason is because there's a, a, a town that's right next to Reno, and it's called Sparks. They're right next to each other. So Reno is basically two towns, the Reno-Sparks area. That particular chapter in my second book is called Six Months in Reno. And my first book, uh, the main character is myself, but the second most common character is my twin brother, my fraternal twin brother, who's a, a nutcase totally different from me. We're like night and day. He's like six inches shorter than me. He's really uh, not talkative, not friendly, not empathetic, uh, but he's an interesting character. And uh, he shows that in my first book and the people that read my first book, if you read my second book, my brother doesn't come in until the middle of the book uh, where he shows up in Reno, Nevada with his cat fuzz. And he didn't have a leash for fuzz and said he had some rope around his fuzz's neck. And he brought fuzz inside the apartment I was renting and uh fuzz just like was like found like i was reading a book i was reading electric kool-aid acid test and fuzz the cat came right over the book knocked the book out of my hand scratched the book and pissed on the book i was like and then hissed at me so like Wah. and i'm like what the fuck and then i was like back in the corner and fuzz is like Wah. i'm like what the fuck it was the first time i was ever scared of a cat but for whatever reason, while we were in Reno, my brother convinces me to sell my car and go with him and Fuzz to Berkeley, California, for some reason, from Reno. And so I get back from the library one day, and he's got my car on a tow truck thing. He's, like, selling it. And uh, I end up going – we end up going to Berkeley. And the second I get in his smelly-ass car, which was basically being used as a, a uh, litter box when him and the cat were driving across the country before they got to Reno – but I get in the car and he has the front seat taken out. And so I'm sitting in the back and then fuzz just looks at me like all confused, like you're coming too. And then fuzz just jumps on my lap and it's like, I'm sitting here, you know, I'm like, okay, we'll be friends. And me and fuzz, the cat ended up being good friends. That particular chapter is called the summer of fuzz and then Berkeley or bust. And then we went up to Humboldt, California, all about um, Arcadia 
and uh, the huge redwood forest up there. Uh, Humboldt was a real small town. My brother didn't like it. So we went to Portland, Oregon after that. Uh, and we somehow found ourselves like in this on the local news in this uh there was a reality show that these people were on and they were um they got kicked off the reality show and then the local news called them the serial squatters because they were these this couple this family and uh this guy this girl and their son and they would go to rich uh, wealthy upper class houses and offer to build huge gardens while they were selling the house and then they would just move into the house and not leave and end up living there for a couple of years and they did this with like three or four houses so we just met them. We had no idea about this. And they were just like, yeah, you guys can stay here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they gave us like our own little uh, trailer room in the back. It was a not a trailer. It was a, a room. It was a little co uh, cottage in the back. And uh, and we're like, this is too good to be true. And it turned out it was too good be, to be true because after a few days, the news crew started showing up, shoving cameras in our face. They're like, are you part of the serial squatters? <laughs> it was a rolling camp, Rich. Like, are you part of the serial squatters? And then we're like, what? Serial squatters? We don't know about that. Uh, so then we leave there and then go to Vancouver, that Vancouver, Washington. That chapter is called Vantucky. That's Vancouver's nickname, Vantucky, because it's like the deep south where Theo Vaughn is from. And everybody's like backwards and like having sex with their cousin and everything like that. But um, th I, I, that's when I ditched my brother. I'm like, fuck Vantucky. Fuck this place. And he wanted to stay. And I'm like, fuck these fucking hillbilly hate country fucking low class motherfuckers. And I fucking ditched my brother. He didn't have my best interest in mind. And then I go out. That's my brother's only part of the book is those, those that brief middle period. Uh, then I had a friend in Seattle, Washington, uh, that she asked me to watch her apartment. So I go to Seattle, Washington, and I stay there for a little while. And then I fly to Hawaii. And Hawaii is the third book. So the second book is about crossing the United States, the third book is all about Hawaii, and it's the Gonzo series. Gonzo Education is available on Amazon right now. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Uh, like I said, we're going to talk more about writing in tomorrow's episode. Uh, the Mr. G Podcast, it's available wherever you listen to podcasts. They're not going to keep me out of this club, boys. I mean, I'm here to stay, all right? If you try to say my podcast isn't good, you're going to make yourself look stupid. If you're going to try to say that I don't sound good, you're going to sound stupid. If you're going to try to say that I don't uh, bring something of value what to the 30 minutes of listening to this, then nobody's going to believe you. All right. Uh, with that being said, the Mr. G podcast, it's available wherever you listen to podcasts, Amazon podcasts, Audacity podcasts, Apple podcasts is the best place. So I encourage you to listen to the Mr. G podcast, share the Mr. G podcast, but listen to it on your way to work while you're at work, while you're at home, while you're cleaning your house, while you're on the train. You can listen to my podcast just like you can listen to any other podcast and Full episodes of the video version of the Mr. G podcast are uploaded in their entirety on Spotify, Twitter, and YouTube. One more thing for today is we're going to go over the uh, Tootsie Pop, the Tootsie Roll. Tootsie Roll. And the reason being is because I wasn't aware that Tootsie Rolls are an American thing. They don't know what the hell Tootsie Rolls are around the world. I'm uh, currently dating a lovely woman from Manchester, England. And I was uh, eating a Tootsie Roll and she's like, what's that? And I'm like, it's a Tootsie Roll. You've never heard of a Tootsie Roll? And she's like, no, is it kind of like a, a Lolo or something? And, then, and I'm like, it's it's like, an, a, a, she's like, do kids like it? And I'm like, it's kind of like an old fashioned candy. It's common around Halloween, but kids aren't really like waiting in line for Tootsie Rolls. I think it's more something grandparents give to their kids. But the history of Tootsie Roll is pretty fascinating. It is an Americana candy. And uh, we're all familiar with the chewy chocolate candy known as Tootsie Roll. Well, in the United States, we are. I don't know about you, but I mostly remember these candies being thrown from floats and parades. I can see how they might help soldiers. Have you ever been hit in the face with a Tootsie Roll? It's no laughing matter. However, that's not exactly what the Marines did with this unexpected package of Tootsie Rolls. In 1950, U.S. Marines were engaged in a battle in North Korea, the Korean War. Uh, they were running out of ammunition and requested an airdrop of ammo. Specifically, they asked for 60 millimeter mortar rounds. The code name for the rounds was Tootsie Roll. 
Uh, imagine the Marine's surprise when the package dropped wasn't filled with bullets, but actual Tootsie Rolls. You have to wonder who was behind this mistake and why they thought dropping a box of Tootsie Rolls was a totally normal thing to do. The soldiers were at first understandably upset and confused. However, they got over it soon enough once they found a purpose for the surprise package. The candies, though frozen cold at the time of delivery, quickly turned into stretchy mush in the soldiers' mouths. What's so important about mushy Tootsie Rolls? Well, it turns out the freezing temperatures caused the fuel lines in several vehicles to crack. The warmed up candies were fastened around the cracks to seal them up. When the candy froze again, it became sort of a makeshift adhe adhesive that ended up helping the troops get out safely. Who knew there was so much history behind Tootsie Rolls? So yeah, that's a fun story. Uh, the Tootsie Rolls during World War II, they were used as an adhesive to fix frozen pipes. So you're ever in a jam and you got some frozen pipes or you're in, uh, doing some car repair, don't forget to keep a bag of Tootsie Rolls on hand. <laughs> All right. Hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Uh, much love to Theo Vaughn. Nah, fuck you, Theo. You're a hater. You'd, you'd always hate me, bro. Joe, because uh, Theo, because uh, uh, somebody like him would always resent me uh, because I'm what... Uh, he, I, I'm not like what he would want to be, but uh, he's not what <laughs> I don't know. I could just tell somebody like him would always resent me. But hey, it is what it is. I'm not going anywhere. Oh, sorry, Andy Milanakis. I talked smack of him about on my uh, essay today. You guys got to check out today's essay as well. Everybody have a great day and uh, shout out to my uh, lovely lady, Jamie. And uh, everybody, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Aloha for me and my street cats.